Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to BMT InfoNet's webinar, CAR T Therapy and Other Immunotherapies Before and After Transplant. I'm delighted you can join us this evening, and I hope you find this presentation valuable as you consider your treatment options. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Kite, a Gilead company, and Celgene, whose support helped make tonight's presentation possible. For those of you who are not familiar with BMT InfoNet, we are a patient advocacy organization that provides high quality information and support services to patients and their loved ones before, during, and after transplant or CAR-T therapy. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Juan Carlos Varela. Dr. Varela leads the cellular therapy, well, I'm sorry, cellular therapy program in the blood and marrow transplant program at Advent Health in Orlando, Florida. He specializes in bone marrow transplantation and cancer immunotherapy. Dr. Varela's research is focused on the development of novel immunotherapies for the treatment of cancer. He has been the principal investigator for several clinical trials studying novel therapies for patients with leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. I will say that Dr. Varela was rated as one of the top two speakers at BMT InfoNet's Celebrating a Second Chance at Life Survivorship Symposium last May in Orlando, and I hope he will do a great presentation. I know he will this evening as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Varela. Thank you, Sue, and uh, welcome everybody that's joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about cancer immunotherapy and CAR T cells over the next uh, 20 to 40 minutes. So we'll get started with uh, talking about what is what are the goals that we're gonna that we're gonna achieve tonight. What are we gonna do? So we're gonna be talking about the bone marrow and the immune system, just to give a background of what the immune system does and how it controls cancer. We're gonna be talking about tumor immunology, which is the study of how your immune system is able to kill cancer cells. We'll be talking about chimeric antigen receptor T cells, so CAR T cells, which is one of the, in my view, one of the greatest advances in immunotherapy um, ever. And finally, we'll be talking about some things that are relevant to patients. What are the CAR T cell therapies that are approved to treat patients with hematological malignancies? So we'll go ahead and get started. We're talking about bone marrow and the immune system. So this is a schematic of your bone marrow. Your bone marrow is the factory of all the cells in your blood. And it's inside of all of our bones. And all of the components of the bone marrow are made from stem cells. For those of you who had a bone marrow transplant in the past, this is what we transplant. We transplant stem cells. Those stem cells divide and they develop into the three different kinds of cells in your blood, which are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Red blood cells are the ones that carry oxygen around. White blood cells are the ones that are in charge of defending you or their immune system. And platelets are the types of cells that prevent you from bleeding or from clots. Now, when we talk about the immune system, the immune system is not only the white blood cells. The immune system is a combination of cells, organs, and substances in your body that work together in combination to protect us from disease. The most common thing that everybody thinks about is that it's just a protection against infections, against bacterial infections, against viruses, or against fungal infections. But in truth, your immune system can also protect you against cancer. And white blood cells play a huge role in all this, and the bone marrow plays a, whole, a huge role in this as well. Now, what is tumor immunology? And a lot of us have heard that term over the last few years because of the explosion of immunotherapy in the cancer world. But tumor immunology is the study of how our immune system is able to protect us against cancer. Now, I know this is a complicated slide, but we're going to take it step by step, and we're going to be talking about how is it that the immune system is able to detect cancer cells, recognize them, and then kill them. So we'll start over here with number one. The first thing that happens is that tumor cells within the tumor microenvironment, whether it is a solid tumor or, in our case, a liquid tumor, there are components of the tumor cell that spill into the circulation once the tumor cell dies. We have these cells in the immune system, which are called dendritic cells, and their job is to police the environment and pick up little pieces of tumor cells 
that may be falling into the microenvironment. Once they pick up those little pieces, then they take into a lymph node. And in the lymph node is where the training of the immune system happens. We, we, we're all born with a number of cells that are called T cells that are able to protect us against infections and also against tumors. So when the dendritic cell goes to the lymph node, it has little pieces of tumors that are recognized by T cells, and those T cells become activated. Once those T cells become activated, they go from the lymph node through the circulation, and they go back to the tumor microenvironment. Now, the third step is once the cells are in the tumor microenvironment, there has to be an interaction between the white blood cell, in this case the T cell, and the tumor cell in order to kill it. Now, that interaction is fairly complicated, and it requires multiple steps that have to happen in a specific sequence in order for that cell to kill that tumor cell. This process works very efficiently, but sometimes, or in many cases, what happens is that tumor cells develop ways to evade the immune system. What sort of things can tumor cells do? Well, it turns out that they actually are able, they have developed ways to stop this immune response at every point in the pathway. So they have ways of inhibiting dendritic cells so that the little pieces of the tumor don't get picked up by the, by the dendritic cells. They have ways to inhibit the activation of the T cells at the lymph node. They've also developed ways to prevent the transfer of those activated T cells to the tumor microenvironment. They've, act, they've developed ways to break up the interaction between activated T cells and tumors, which leads to the, the immune system not being able to kill the tumor. This is not all bad news because as we studied these ways in which tumor cells are able to evade the immune system, we actually picked up some clues and we've developed ways to bypass these blockages so that we can reactivate the immune system against cancer and develop cancer immunotherapies. So really by learning how these tumors evade the immune system, this is how we've developed these therapies, including CAR-Ts, that now we're using in the treatment of cancer. Just a quick mention about cancer immunotherapy. For the past few decades, the main types of treatments that were available for cancer were three. It was chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. It wasn't until about 2011 or so that we really started considering immunotherapy as the fourth modality in cancer treatment. And now when I see patients today, most patients are asking about immunotherapy. So now we can say that immunotherapy has arrived as the fourth pillar of treatment for cancer. And again, this all comes from the fact that we have been studying for years how is it that these tumor cells evade the immune system because of the knowledge that we have gained. Now we have been able to develop these therapies. One of the most exciting therapies that have been developed in the past few decades has been CAR T cells. And I know there's been a lot of excitement about CAR T cells. There's been a lot of news about CAR T cells. Uh, so let's take a step into what is it? What are CAR T cells? I think that in order to understand how CAR T cells work and why they're so special, we need to just take a step back and think about how do normal T cells work? And we learned a little bit about that a few slides ago when we saw how those cells get activated. But this is just a reminder. We have our tumor cell over here that's spilling pieces of the tumor into the microenvironment. The dendritic cell picks it up, picks up those little pieces. They go to the lymph node. These T cells that are there resting see the dendritic cell with the little pieces of tumor. They get activated. Those cells then transition or travel to the tumor microenvironment. And then there's a direct interaction with the tumor cell. There are receptors on, on the T cells that recognize the pieces of the tumor that are being made by the tumor cell, and that leads to the killing of these tumor cells. So it really is a complicated, um, but very well regulated and very successful process that leads to the activation of T cells and to the killing of tumor cells by these T cells. Now, when you think about CAR T cells, you really skip a lot of the steps that it takes to activate these T cells. Instead of going through the whole process of picking up the pieces of tumor, going through the dendritic cell, taking it to the lymph node, what this CAR T cell therapy allows us to do is we genetically modify these cells and we have 
a cell that is able to recognize the tumor right away. Another thing that's very important to understand about CAR T-cells is that the interaction between a CAR T-cell and a tumor cell is completely different from what a normal T-cell and a tumor cell is. This interaction is much simpler. It doesn't require the same, num same number of steps that it does to kill a tumor cell by a normal T-cell. So that makes this therapy very easy um, and very effective. One way that I like to describe this is for those of you guys that have, that have played salmon cells before, you can compare normal T cells and the process of activating those cells as having to play salmon cells and having to press the buttons in a certain order. Whatever it is, blue, blue, red, red, green, but it has to be in the right order. Otherwise, that process will not work. Now, CAR T cells, we can just compare them to the easy button. You just press a button, the cells get, get activated, and they're ready to go, ready to kill tumor. One of the most common questions that I, I get from patients is, how are these T-cells made? And for those of you that have had a stem cell transplant in the past, this process is very similar to what you've had before, especially for those of you that have had an autologous stem cell transplant in the past. So we'll take this step by step. The first thing that happens is we have to collect the patient's T-cells from the peripheral blood, and this is represented here. The second thing that happens is those cells are typically shipped to a lab. Uh, we have several labs throughout the country, and there's several companies doing this. And in those labs is where the CAR T cells are going to make. And remember, we said CAR T cells are genetically modified cells. They're modified cells that come from the patient. How do we modify those cells? Well, we actually use a virus, and uh, most, in most cases, this is a virus that belongs to the same family as the HIV virus, but it's a virus that cannot cause disease in humans. It's a virus that's been modified, and we only use it as a delivery method for genetic material, for genetic code. So we take viruses, we put a little piece of genetic code, which is encoding for that CAR receptor. We put it into the normal T cells, and after a process, we get this chimeric cells. Chimeric just means that there's two different types of genetic code inside a cell. So you have the normal code from the cell, and the CAR code that has been, that's been put in by that virus. Once that code is inside the T cell, the T cell is able to read it. It produces the CAR T cell receptors, and it puts them on the surface of the cell. Then we take those cells and expand them to many millions of cells, and we have all, a lot of CAR T cells that are now ready to recognize the tumor. Now, this is a process that happens outside the body, but compared to what has to happen inside the body when a normal T cell is getting ready to kill a tumor, this process is really straightforward and streamlined. Once those cells are made, those cells get shipped back to the hospital, to the place where the patient is being treated, and they get infused back into the patient. So, like I said before, this is a process that is very similar to what folks that have an autologous transplant have, had, have undergone in the past. The main difference is that instead of taking stem cells like we do for a, for a stem cell transplant, we simply take T cells, in the case of a stem cell transplant, we do not genetically modify the stem cells. We just take the stem cells out, and then we put them back into the patient after giving them some chemotherapy. In this case, we take the T cells out, genetically engineer them, grow them to an appropriate number, and then put it back to the patient. So that's the general process of number one, what is the immune system? What is tumor immunology? How does a normal T cell work? How does the immune system work to recognize tumors? What have we learned from that process, and how do we take advantage of those evasion mechanisms to develop cancer immunotherapy? And we focused on talking about one specific type of cancer immunotherapy, which is CAR T cells. How are they different from normal T cells, and how they're made? So now we have the background, and we can move forward to, to talking about, now that we've made them, how do we apply them to the treatment of patients? So currently, there are two FDA-approved CAR T cell therapies. One of them is called Kimraya, and the other one is called Yescarta. Both of them target a protein called CD19, which is in the surface of specific cancer cells, and it's actually in the surface of many types of B cell lymphomas. And we'll talk about indications in just a second. We'll talk about Kimraya first. That was the first product that was FDA-approved. It is approved for the treatment of relapsed refractory 
acute lymphoblastic leukemia in patients up to 25-year-olds, so pediatric patients. And it's also approved for certain types of relapse refractory non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, specifically diffuse large piece of lymphoma, high-grade lymphoma, and diffuse large piece of lymphoma transformed from follicular lymphoma. The second product that has been approved is Yescarta. Uh, the Yescarta is approved for the treatment of certain types of relapse refractory non-Hodgkin lymphoma, just like we spoke before, very similar to the other product. Uh, this is approved for diffuse large piece of lymphoma, high-grade lymphomas, and diffuse large piece of lymphoma has been transformed for follicular lymphoma. Depending on where you live, uh, there's likely a center that's able to give this therapy to you. Um, there are both companies that produce these products have websites that you can refer to, and uh, you can look and see if this treatment is right for you, if this treatment is close to where you live. But for the, the high likelihood is that somewhere close to you, there'll be a hospital or a center that's able to provide this product. Now, one of the main things that we all want to know is, do CAR T cells work? And my answer is an emphatic yes. I think that um, I've mentioned this before. This is one of the most exciting therapies that has been developed for the treatment of cancer in the past few decades. And uh, some of the data that, that we have now that's concrete coming from clinical trials. In pediatric and adult ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we have complete, res complete response rates uh, somewhere between 81 to 83%. This is really remarkable considering that the patients that have gone into these trials are usually patients that have failed multiple lines of therapy. So this really is um, a home run as far as treatment goes. In adult non Hodgkin's lymphoma, we've also had some very good results. Again, the patients that have been treated under the trials that have been reported in these studies are patients that have failed multiple lines of therapy patients that have received lots of chemo, lots of other things, uh, but they also respond. We've had overall response rates in the range from 52 to 82%, and we've had complete response rates in the rate of 40 to almost 60%. Now, what is the difference between overall response rate and complete response rate? Complete overall response rate includes everybody that had a response, so whether you had a complete response or a partial response, that's included in this number. And the complete responses are the ones where we cannot see any evidence of lymphoma anymore. And again, I want to emphasize again, 40%, uh, 59% may seem like a low number, but before CAR T cells came around, we couldn't dream to achieve 40 or 50% response rates with the therapies that we had available for these patients. So really, this is a fantastic new tool that we have to treat our patients. Whenever we have a treatment that is as effective as this, we can expect that there's going to be some risks and, and some caution that we have to have with these therapies. CAR T cell is no different. CAR T cells have um, a specific side effect profile. There's a specific group of side effects that come along with it. When we first started the trials with CAR T cells, the side effects tended to be more severe as we learned more about how the therapy worked, how to change it, how to make it safer, now, we are pretty good at, at uh, treating and controlling the symptoms, but they can still happen. So there's two things that I want to mention here, which are the two most common side effects of CAR T cell therapy. Uh, one of them is called cytokine release syndrome. Um, how does that present? That presents with fever. It can present with low blood pressure, low level of oxygen in the blood. But the most common presentation is fever. What exactly is this? Cytokines are one of those substances that we talked about before that are part of the immune system. It's kind of how this immune system talks to each other, to each of its cells. Uh, when you have an interaction between a CAR T cell and a tumor cell, um, the cytokines are made and the interaction is so robust that sometimes you can make too much of these cytokines, too much of these substances, which leads to the symptoms of fever, low blood pressure, low level of oxygen in the blood. There's different grades of cytokine release syndrome, and the treatment could be as simple as observation, or the treatment could be as severe as having to take the patient to the, to the intensive care unit, watch them very closely, monitor them very closely. The second type of, of uh, side effect that's uh, unique uh, to CAR T cell therapy is the neurotoxicity. 
What does that mean? It means that their patient may have neurological symptoms. And the symptoms could be something as simple as confusion. Maybe they forget what day it is or uh, they're a little somnolent. They have a little headache. But the symptoms could also be very severe. Patients could have seizures. A patient could have symptoms of stroke. What's really unique about the side effect is that the majority of the time, more than 95, 98% of the time, actually, these symptoms recover on their own. Uh, we watch the patient very closely. We give them all the supportive care that's needed, but the symptoms resolve on their own. Patients do not have any lasting side effects that would affect them in as far as a neurological way. Now, uh, I put it here again, but um, we have developed ways to deal with these adverse side effects, both the cytokine release syndrome and the neurotoxicity. We're still very careful with who we give CAR T cells to. The centers that are being selected to give CAR T cells have to go through a very rigorous process of selection. Uh, the FDA and the companies that are working to bring this to patients have a very strict uh, pathway for, to, that has to be followed in order to be able to give this product. So whenever you have, um, whenever you go to a center that is able to give CAR T cells, they've already gone to a very uh, strenuous process of activation and approval. So these folks are able to give these products safely. One of the things that we wanted to talk about was how does CAR T cell, how, what, what is the, the, the treatment with CAR T cells? What does that fall in the transplant process? Uh, do we do it before transplant? Do we do it after transplant? So the trials that have been done, a number of patients that underwent CAR T cell therapy actually had the treatment done after transplant. We had patients that had the treatment, treatment done after an autologous transplant for lymphoma, or they had the treatment done after an allogeneic transplant for ALL. There's other clinical trials that are ongoing right now for which patients with multiple myeloma are having CAR T cell treatment after transplant. If you're less recently lymphoma, patients can have the treatment after transplant. ALL patients have had it after transplant, and we're trying to understand how does it fall before transplant. In some cases, we can use CAR T cell therapy as a bridge to transplant. For example, if a patient has had a very hard time getting into a remission or getting into a level in which it's safe to do a bone marrow transplant, we can use CAR T cell therapy to get them there. Uh, we don't have the perfect answer yet, the pro perfect algorithm, and this is very much personalized treatment. Every patient is going to be a little bit different. Now, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, uh, can CAR T cell treatment lead to a cure? I think we don't know the answer to that yet. I think that it's going to be disease-specific. We have some uh, very promising data in the, in the lymphoma field. Uh, we do not know yet whether that will be the case in myeloma. Um, and we do not know yet if that would be the case in leukemia. But it's possible, and like I said before, it is perhaps more likely that we'll have to combine CAR T cell with something else to get to that point. But um, this is still a very promising treatment. It gives us an option for folks that did not have any options in the past. Now, the last few slides here, what I want to talk about is some of the frequently asked questions uh, that patients ask that have been brought up in the past. So the first one is, what kind of testing is involved prior to treatment with a CAR T cell? For those of you that have had a, a transplant in the past, it's very much the same. Um, the requirements are a little different depending on what product is given and really depending on whether the the treatment is given on, on a clinical trial or not. If uh, the treatment is given in a clinical trial, it is likely that those clinical trials will have specific enrollment criteria in order for the patient to be able to receive that treatment. But in general, uh, what we need to do as physicians is to make sure that the patient is healthy enough to receive the treatment. So just like we do for transplant, we evaluate the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, and the entire, pro and the entire body to make sure the patient is healthy enough. And also, we need to make sure that the disease that the patient has, it makes, that it makes sense to treat the patient with this therapy with CAR T cells. Another common question is, is, is CAR T cell therapy given inpatient or outpatient? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on the CAR T cell product. 
when we first began this journey of CAR T cell therapy, the majority of all of all, all of the treatment was done in patients. Um, patients would be in the hospital, similar to what we do with our with our stem cell transplants. We watch them for a couple of weeks, maybe several weeks, depending on whether there were any side effects, and then the patients would be discharged. What's happened over the last few years is that more centers are moving this to the outpatient setting. Patients are receiving transfusion or the infusion of the cells as in the outpatient setting, and they're being monitored from home. Uh, there are clinical trials that are ongoing right now uh, to determine how safe this is to do, but so far the signal has been very good. We think that uh, with selected patients, depending on the status of the disease, we'll be able to perform this in the outpatient setting uh, with the goal of only bringing the patient into the hospital if the patient has any complications or any side effects from the treatment. Another question is, uh, is chemotherapy given with CAR T cell therapy? And the answer is yes. A low dose of chemotherapy is given within three days or 72 hours before receiving the CAR T cells. Why do we do that? We call this therapy, call, this, we call this therapy lymphodepletion chemotherapy. And the object here is to make a little bit of room inside the patient, a little bit of room inside the immune system, so that these cells have a chance to grow inside the patient so that they can go and kill the tumor. It's uh, really a low-dose chemotherapy, low intensity, compared to what a patient would normally get for the treatment of lymphoma, treatment of leukemia, treatment of myeloma, or even much more uh, less uh, aggressive than the chemotherapy that patients get before a stem cell transplant. How long does the CAR T cell therapy process take? Uh, it takes anywhere between two to four weeks to make the CAR T cells, uh, perhaps closer to the four-week mark than the two-week mark. And once the, pa once the cells are collected from the patient, they get sent to the manufacturing facility, two to four, week two to four weeks to make the cells, then the cells get infused into the patient. Um, the first two to four weeks are the period within which the more side effects can happen. So we watch patients very closely, whether the treatment is done in a clinical trial, there may be some mandated time in the hospital. If the, patient, if the treatment is done as one of the approved, uh, if the approved uh, therapies, then there's, there's likely, likely it's gonna be done in the hospital for most of the time with some of the patients being done outside of, being done outside of the hospital. So. Uh, I think the process is, is close to um, two months, two to four weeks to get the cells done, and probably another four weeks of uh, after the infusion of the cells uh, is given. What other side effects can happen besides the cytokine release syndrome and the neurotoxicity? Uh, those two, like I mentioned, are the most common ones, but other things that can happen are things that you associate with with cancer, with chemotherapy, low counts are going to happen uh, because of the, the therapy, because of the lymphodepletion chemotherapy and the CAR T cells. You could have GI symptoms like vomiting, like diarrhea. Uh, muscle or joint pain has also been reported. Um, very much like what you'd expect with receiving chemo before transplant, receiving chemo for lymphoma, myeloma, or leukemia. Now, if there are any questions that I didn't cover in those frequently asked questions, please do ask us, and we'll we'll, we'll address those after this uh, after we finish the the formal presentation here. I want to take a little bit of time to talk about some of the research that's being done in CAR T cell, because although we have some products that have been approved, we are really moving at a very fast pace as far as the research goes. One of the most exciting things. Uh, besides the lymphoma and the ALL has been the treatment of multiple myeloma with CAR T cells. There are several clinical trials that are being um, looked at right now where patients have been treated. Uh, we have some very good preliminary data. We're trying to understand how long the effect of the CAR T cells lasts in these patients. Um, it is possible that this could be one of the next FDA approved indications. We don't know the final verdict yet, but there's some very good research going on uh, in multiple myeloma and CAR T cells. Um, CAR T cells for the treatment of other types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma besides the ones that we mentioned earlier, for example, treatment of follicular lymphoma, treatment of mantle cell, treatment of CLL. Uh, those treatments are being investigated right now in clinical trials. 
data is very promising. Um, it is possible that we will have approval for some of these cancers very soon. Mantle cell can be the next, is, could possibly be the next one that will be approved. Uh, but uh, stay tuned because I think within the next year we're going to have several other types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that's going to be treated with CAR T cells. Now, as a leukemia doctor, the majority of my patients with acute leukemia have AML. And one of the questions that we get again is, do we have any CAR T cells for AML? In the beginning, finding a target on the AML cells was a little more difficult to finding a target in the acute leukemia in the ALL cells or in the myeloma or lymphoma cells. Now, more recently, we have found some targets that we believe will be good, will be safe. So there are several clinical trials, again, that are open right now and enrolling, studying the role of CAR T cells in the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, there's a great amount of interest in the field to develop this treatment for this specific type of disease. This is an interesting one. Um, we know as, as a community of physicians and as a community of, of blood cancer patients that one of the biggest reasons why patients don't do well after an allodeneic transplant is because the disease relapses, because the disease comes back. In order to address this issue, there are some researchers right now that are looking at using this CAR T therapy after an allogeneic transplant treated patients with relapsed blood cancers. Right now, we're looking at lymphoma, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and CLL that has relapsed after an allogeneic transplant. Now, what's different about these trials? The difference is that as opposed to getting the T cells that are going to be modified from the patient, what these guys are doing is they're going to the donor of the stem cell transplant. They're getting the T cells from the donor of the stem cell transplant. They're modifying those T cells, and they're giving them back to the patient. So they are an allogeneic CAR T cell product. I think that that is a very exciting um, modality. I think that that's the next frontier in the treatment uh, using CAR T cells, is using an allogeneic source of T cells, and we're all looking forward to the results of these clinical trials. This is a little bit of an old statistic. is now, you know, five months old, but as of March of 2019, there were 378 active clinical trials of CAR T cell therapy in the world, and 145 of those were here in the United States. That's really an astonishing number considering that less than 10 years ago, we had a handful. We didn't have that many. This therapy has really exploded, and I think it really has changed the way that we treat blood cancers and that we're going to treat blood cancers in the future. If um, you guys don't know, there's, there is this website, clinicaltrials.gov, that has a listing of all the clinical trials that are available for patients. So that's a good reference to have. So that's the information about CAR T cells, about the immune system, about tumor immunology. I hope that we've covered the topics that are of interest to you. Uh, if there are any questions that you have, please, please, answer, please ask them now. We'll be uh, glad to answer those questions. But just a quick summary of what we covered today. So, We've talked about how our immune system is able to recognize and destroy cancer cells. We mentioned that there are, there are methods that the tumors have developed to evade this immune control, but by learning how these tumors evade the immune system, we have developed therapies that are enabling us to cure cancer in some cases. CAR T cells are one of those new treatments, one of those immunotherapies that have been uh, developed. Um, it is CAR T cells are a viable option for patients that uh, have relapsed after an autologous transplant or allodeneic transplant. So it is a therapy that can be given after transplant. And most importantly, I think, is that we've made great progress so far with this therapy. But I think what's to come is going to be extremely exciting. Uh, we're going to have so many more chances, so many more options for patients that sorely need these therapies. And I think CAR T cells are going to bring us uh, a lot of uh, novel therapies that are going to be very, very successful in treating patients with blood cancers. I just want to leave you with an image. Um, I found this many years ago, and I thought it was the perfect description of what a CAR T cell is. Here we have a normal T cell, and here we have Mr. CAR T cell. So with that, I'll close, and uh, we'll take any questions that you guys may have. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Varela. That was a great and very clear explanation of what CAR-T is and I think has answered a lot of the questions that folks have. We do have a number of questions. And again, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen and Dr. Varela will answer as many of those as we can get uh, done in, in the amount of time that's left. <clears throat> so let me start with a question from Maritza. She wants to know how many times you can do a CAR-T uh, therapy. So initially, the plan is to do one, one treatment with CAR-T cell therapy. Um, there have been some clinical trials and some patients that have been retreated with CAR T cells depending on the situation. But in general, we plan to do one treatment with CAR T cells and we wait and see what the response is um, depending on the situation, depending on whether we have enough cells to do a second treatment. We have done second treatments in the past. All right, and we have a couple of questions uh, from Mariana and Angelina about the success of CAR T therapy for Richter syndrome. Yeah, so we, we actually have looked at that. Uh, many of the clinical trials that have been, that have been uh, uh, done had Richter uh, transformation patients in those trials. Um, and although the subset analysis, meaning that specifically looking at Richter transformation, we, we don't have a, um, at the specific data on that, the patients with Richter transformation have been enrolled in those trials and are actually eligible for the treatment. So it is a possibility. It is an option for patients with risk of transformation. The final verdict on, on how effective it is, it's still coming, uh, and we'll find out soon uh, as far as percentages of response. But it's definitely something that we use in this population of patients. All right, Gary, <clears throat> excuse me. Gary would like to know if there's a way to verify if CD19 or CD20 or CD22 exists on the surface of the tumor cell prior to the reinfusion of the modified CAR T cells? Absolutely. So we have very sensitive methods. Uh, <clears throat> we can easily tell whether this surface, whether this protein is, is expressed on the surface. And that's a great question because as a community uh, of physicians, we, we ask that and we say, okay, uh, we, of course we need to have the target in order for the therapy to be effective. Um, there are some trials that are looking at whether or not um, the, the CD19 negative cells uh, are killed as well. Uh, but in general, yes. The answer is yes, we have a way to look at it. Yes, you have to have the expression of that protein in order for the therapy to be effective. Marie would like to know what the average lifespan is for a patient who had CAR-T therapy. It varies on the disease, and it varies on the response to therapy. Um, I think the best example of this has been uh, the first ALL pediatric CAR T cell patient, um, her name is Emily. She was treated at the University of uh, Philadelphia. Um, I believe she um, is now in her late teens. She was treated when she was uh, much younger than that. So you can have prolonged survival. It all really depends on the patient. It's uh, different in every case. Um, like we mentioned before, we are thinking that in some of the lymphoma patients, this may be a cure. Um, we're not quite ready as a community to say that, but it is possible. In the leukemia patients, we're still uh, having some discussions about that, but there are some very long-term survivals in pediatric patients that have been treated with, with uh, CAR-T cell therapy. James would like to know uh, whether, <clears throat> excuse me, some autologous stem cells that he has stored for transplant could be used instead for CAR-T therapy, and if not, could they be used for anything else other than transplant? So uh, stem cell, the stem cells that were collected for an autologous transplant cannot be used uh, as a CAR T cell therapy. We have to collect T cells uh, if the patient wants to undergo that treatment again. Can those stem cells be used for anything else besides transplant? Um, they could be used um, for research purposes. Uh, sometimes there are uh, things that specific um, centers do in, in, in the investigating new treatments for blood cancers or understanding some of the processes that happen. Uh, but typically, once we have those cells for a patient, they are there for the patient. Um, in some cases, uh, for example, a multiple myeloma, we do more than one transplant, so those cells will be used for a second transplant if possible. Lawrence would like to know whether there's an age limit for CAR-T therapy. There isn't a, 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 a hard limit. 
I think what we look at is at the condition of the patient. I think that in certain clinical trials, there will be a limit, um, but um, we just like there isn't a, a specific limit for stem cell transplant, um, we evaluate the patient, and if we believe that they're healthy enough to undergo the procedure, we do it. Jason would like to know, from an emotional or psychological perspective, what kind of patient does best with CAR-T therapy, and what kind of patient does worst? I think that um, this is, uh, very, and again, I keep referring to this, but I think that this is very similar to the transplant process. I think that um, cancer patients are tough patients. They're special patients and uh, they deal with a lot. So um, if you're able to tolerate therapy and have good support and uh, have been successful with a transplant or with uh, strong chemotherapy in the past, I think that uh, you will do just fine with this process. Um, this is tough. Having a cancer diagnosis is tough. Having a diagnosis of a blood cancer can really bring you down, but I think it's all about the patient, the support, uh, you got to make sure that you have a team that you trust, a doctor that you trust that can uh, can get you through the process. But uh, there isn't a specific type. I think uh, all of our patients are special. All of, our, all of our patients can do this if they put their mind to it. Um, Les would like to know, uh, he's been in remission for over three years after an autologous stem cell transplant for non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Hodgkin disease. Would CAR T cell therapy be offered if a patient is in remission? No. Uh, right now, the CAR T cell therapy is only offered if a patient has relapse disease. Okay. And Eric would like to know, in multiple myeloma, how long is progression-free survival according to the latest CAR T studies? So that's a, that's a very good question, and that's, that's a question that uh, the myeloma community is, uh, is uh, dealing with right now. Uh, the latest data shows that the progression-free survival from these therapies it's about 12 months. It's about 11, 11 to 12 months. Um, that's been a little bit disappointing to us in the field, and that's what we're trying to understand. You know, do we need to hit a different target? Do we need to change something about the process? Okay. Gary wants to know, are there any CAR-T trials targeting CD22 on the surface of the tumor cell in the setting of CLL? There are trials uh, that, have been, that are targeting CD22. I will refer you to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, you can put in CD22, uh, CLL, and you'll find a listing of the trials that are available. But there has been some research done in this in uh, looking at that target. Uh, it's a common target in, uh, in lymphocytes, in B lymphocytes. Um, we can, uh, it's also used for leukemia, for ALL. Um, so the art trials that are looking at CD22 as a target right now. All right, and Olive would like to know whether you need a transfusion line for CAR T therapy. A transfusion line. So if we're ta if we're talking about whether you need transfusions, meaning blood and platelets, um, after the procedure, yes, it is possible that you will, depending on how low your counts drop. I hope that that's the question: is whether whether you need transfusions. I'm not sure what transfusion line means. Are we talking about a catheter, maybe? She may be talking about a catheter, yes. Okay. Uh, so that depends on the center. Uh, some centers have um, created pathways, and some of them say we're going to put in a catheter, um, whether it is a transfusion catheter similar to what we do for transplants or a, or a PICC line or something else to go through the process. Um, I think the majority of centers do that. Some centers don't. Some centers, if the patient has good veins, we can do all this uh, with, peripheral, with peripheral IVs, but it depends on the center and on the patient. George would like to know what the cost of CAR-T uh, treatment is. That is a fantastic question. And as a community of uh, oncologists and cellular therapists, we have been uh, dealing with that over the last uh, couple of years since this treatment came out. I know that it's no secret that this is a very expensive treatment, and we are working with insurers, with Medicare, to get this paid. Um, we have had uh, experience that uh, private insurance have been uh, reasonably uh, good at paying for this treatment, and uh, now Medicare has some new rules where they're going to increase the coverage of this treatment. Um, but it's still going to be, it's still something that hospitals and providers and insurers 
are, are dealing with. So I think that if a patient needs to have this treatment, um, there are ways that uh, this can be figured out. The, each center is going to have a different process for making sure this, uh, that the patient can receive this treatment. Catherine would like to know what the statistics are regarding mortality after CAR-T treatment. And I presume she means related to the CAR-T treatment. Yeah. So th there, there have been some deaths that were um, – that were that happened in the clinical trials, and but they have been really minimal. Uh, I think that uh, um, some trials had uh, two people um, die in the same trial um, from uh, cerebral edema in the past. There have been some new data with a couple of other patients have died, but of the hundreds of patients that have been treated with CAR T cells, the mortality related to CAR T cell has been very very low. Uh, I would estimate that the CAR T cell death related specifically to the CAR T-cells has been probably less than 5%. Now, um, mortality can happen from the disease, from a complication, from, you know, an infection or something else that happens. Uh, whether or not we consider that as part of the CAR T-cell process, I guess it will depend on the timing. Uh, but from the, from the medication itself, from the drug itself, from the T-cells itself, the mortality is very low, although the side effects can happen in 30% of folks, 40% of folks the majority of the folks, folks recover from those side effects. Okay, we have a question from Mary, and Mary, I'm going to ask you to restate this question. At what point in the process are the mentioned drugs administered? Um, if you understand that, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll wait for Mary to restate it. Tell me one more time, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, at what point in the process are the mentioned drugs administered? I'm not quite sure I understand that. Do you? Okay, maybe when she's talking about the the lymphodepletion uh, right before oh, uh, that was given with the, so I'll I'll give that a try. So the 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 lymphodepletion, the chemotherapy, the low dose chemotherapy, is given right before the cells are being fused. So the patient uh, undergoes collection of the T cells. The T cells gets manufactured. Once we know that the T cells have been made, we bring the patient into into the infusion center or hospital. We give them the low-dose low lymphodepletion, the low-dose chemotherapy, and then after that, the patient gets the, gets the CAR T cells. Okay. Jennifer would like to know uh, whether CAR T therapy for myelodysplastic syndrome or MDS is on the horizon. We have not uh, looked at, uh, at that quite yet. Uh, there are some trials with, that we mentioned before that are looking at AML, some of the trials may also allow folks with uh, high-grade MDS. Um, I think that that's probably something that we will do in the future um, because, you know, folks with MDS sometimes need transplants, sometimes need more aggressive therapies. Um, and in my view, MDS tends to have um, a slower progression than some of the acute leukemias, which will give us more time so that therapies like this will uh, have its maximum effect. So my prediction is that it will probably become something that's used uh, in the near future. Spencer says that he has refractory ALL, has it relapsed three times within the past two times, including CNS involvement, and has had two stem cell transplants. Wants to know if there are any patients that have undergone CAR T cell therapy with the main issue being CNS disease. Yes, so now um, CAR T cells are being used with patients uh, that have uh, secondary CNS lymphoma, um, and also um, with patients that have uh, CNS disease. At the beginning, some of the trials would exclude patients that have CNS uh, leukemia, but now we're starting to understand that it's safe to give CAR T cells. Um, most of that right now is being done in the CNS lymphoma field, not in the ALL, ALL with CNS involvement, though. Allison would like to know how long after treatment do you wait to know whether or not CAR T has been effective? It we we normally monitor the patients and, and it's different on every patient. Uh, in some patients, we know whether it's working right away. Um, you know, if it's a patient with leukemia, we can see that the leukemic burden is going down. If it's a patient with lymphoma, there and we can image and see if it's uh, if it's been a result uh, a month. Uh, it's it's uh, um, 
a period in which we can take a look and see if the masses are getting smaller. Um, it's also dictated a little bit by whether the patient is in a clinical trial or not. Uh, clinical trials will have a specific timing as when you look and see whether the treatment has had responded or not. If you're getting a FDA-approved product, that's going to be a discussion that's going to be had that has to be had with your provider, with your doctor, as to when the time to look will be. But I would say, uh, in the number, you know, in the range of weeks after after therapy, you can take a look and see if the, if the CAR T have worked. Victoria understands that CAR T cell therapy is being used for B cell lymphoma, but wonders whether it can also be used for uh, T cell lymphoma. Uh, specifically relapsed angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma? The answer is yes. Theoretically, it can. Um, especially, we, there are some uh, CAR T-cells that are being developed to target, for example, CD30. CD30 is a common um, protein on angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma. So, yes, it can. Um, uh, it's not something that's one of the approved indications for these T-cells yet but in clinical trials in the future is something that can be done. Olive would like to know, can you do the BITE, B-I-T-E, if CAR T-cell is not successful? It depends on the situation. And uh, um, I think right now, as far as the timing of different therapies, for example, there is a BITE therapy uh, for ALL. I think most folks would receive BITE therapy before CAR T cell therapy, that at least has been the experience, uh, my experience, um, but mainly because BITE came along before CAR T cells. Will we use CAR T cells or will we use BITE after CAR T cells? It's possible if the patient hasn't seen it uh, or hasn't been treated with that yet, uh, but typically BITEs come before CAR Ts. Russ would like to know if there are trials currently using CAR T cells combined with other therapies or other immunotherapies uh, to improve results? Yeah, we're thinking about there, there's, there's uh, some, uh, some research being done exploring uh, molecules we call checkpoint inhibitors, um, things like pembrolizumab or nivolumab, uh, which are molecules that kind of take the breaks of the immune system. Uh, we think combining these with the CAR T cells would enhance the treatment. I think that in solid tumors, there's going to be some interest in uh, developing combination therapies like what you suggest. Anna would like to know whether CAR T therapy is as dangerous as an allogeneic transplant. That's a good question. Um, personally, I believe that um, the, the risk of... Uh, CAR T cell therapy falls somewhere between an autologous transplant and a genetic transplant. Um, it's also going to depend on the patient, but in general, uh, it's perhaps not as intense. Uh, the side effects are not going to be as intense as what you have with an allogeneic transplant. Um, so probably not as not as not as severe as an allogeneic transplant. Marshall would like to know for allogeneic CAR T patients. Is graft versus host disease expected along with the cytokine release syndrome? So that's something, that's the reason that we're doing the clinical trials, and especially the clinical trial where, we're do, where we are uh, generating CAR T cells from the donor. I think that's one of the main interests is we want to see can we do this safely without causing GVHD? Um, that's going to be something that we're all going to be looking forward to uh, as far as hopefully that's not the case, uh, but we're in the middle of studying that right now. Uh, Russ would like to know why we're not trying CAR T as a first line of treatment for multiple myeloma when the patient is younger and healthier. Yeah, that's a great question, um, and I think that um, it's the same thing with a lot of therapies. Uh, whenever we're doing clinical trials, the patients that are enrolled in those clinical trials are typically the patients that have failed multiple treatments. Once we show that our therapy is effective, uh, we start moving it further and further forward in the treatment. So I, I, I agree. I think that someday we may have a trial where we're doing um, CAR T's as first line for some of these diseases like multiple myeloma lymphoma. Um, right now, there are some clinical trials that are looking at moving uh, the treatment of uh, CAR T's 
of, of, of lymphoma, of diffuse large piece of lymphoma with CAR T's a little bit further up. So there are trials that are comparing whether an autologous transplant is better or whether CAR T cell is better. So um, we have to slowly move things uh, towards the front of the line when it comes to novel therapies. But I believe that someday we may be seeing this as the first line treatment. Uh, Maria would like to know whether it's a good sign that after CAR T cell therapy, you've had no side effects. Uh, people have looked at that, uh, whether or not there's a, there's a correlation in between whether a patient gets CRS or not and whether the ther therapy works. There's no clear data that that's the case. So we can't tell you, you know, there's, there's really no, um, that's not going to be a, a relationship between those two. I think we just have to see whether the treatment works or not at the appropriate time, but there's no, no correlation between side effects and effectiveness right now. Mary wonders whether, whether there is any maintenance chemotherapy following CAR T therapy. No, there is not. Um, as of now, um, you know, CAR T cells um, are a destination treatment in some cases or a bridging therapy if we do it before an allogeneic transplant. Uh, but we typically don't give maintenance therapy after giving CAR T cell therapy. That may change in the past. Maybe if we have an immunomodulatory molecule that we think may enhance the enhance or prolong the effect of CAR T cells, that may be something that we do in the in the future. But right now, that's not something that's done. Um, Angelina lives in the Philippines and says that CAR T therapy is not available in the Philippines. She wonders if it's possible to still be enrolled somehow in a clinical trial, and if so, how. Um, I think that um, there are some clinical trials that are uh, approved or that are being done internationally. Um, China is actually a very large site for clinical trials in CAR-T. Um, I think that a clinical trial in the United States for someone that doesn't live here is going to be a little more difficult um, because some of the insurance uh, challenges, uh, even though a patient is in a clinical trial, there are still things that are paid by the insurance. So if there's no insurance, it's going to be very hard to enroll in the clinical trial. Um, but I would say that uh, there are international places, uh, China close to the Philippines, that have this available. And I hope that this becomes available worldwide, that worldwide at some point. Um, Susan wants to know whether CAR-T therapy can help with graft-versus-host disease. At this time, we, we don't believe that's the case. Um, we have not, these cells don't have an, an, an inhibitory capacity, meaning that they can block the effect of, of graft versus host disease. Um, there are other cellular therapies that are not CAR T cells that are being used and are in clinical trials to treat graft versus host disease. The immune system has cells that are both killers, like, like T cells, and has cells that are more inhibitory. So we're trying to take some of those inhibitory cells and use them in the setting of graft versus host disease to see if we can get some results and help patients with that disease. Um, Stephen wants to know what kind of downtime is involved for the CAR T patient and how quickly can, can one return to work? Typically, I would say it's this, uh, somewhere between 45 to 60 days of, of very close monitoring. Uh, obviously, when you get the collection to what the time that you get the cells is going to be three to four weeks, then it's about a month until after you get the stem cells. Uh, I think it depends on, oh, I'm sorry, not the stem cells, but the CAR T cells. I think it depends on what type of work you do. Um, it's going to be, like we've said before, similar to autologous transplants, perhaps a little longer. Uh, I would say probably after 90 days would probably be the best case scenario, but it depends on the patient. It depends on on what type of job or work you do. Um, and Jeff wants to know, uh, he has high risk factor IQ gain. Is CAR-T an option for him? Um, I'm guessing that that is going to be uh, um, uh, a one Q in myeloma. Um, if that's the case, then yes, we're looking at uh, treatment of multiple myeloma with CAR-T cells. Um, right now, the, the mutations, the cytogenetic changes, um, all of those are being, uh, being looked at. Uh, we don't have a subgroup analysis to see whether it works better for, you know, translocation 1114 or deletion 1Q or 1P. Right now we're taking all multiple myeloma patients and looking at whether uh, this treatment works for those patients. But, yeah, it's available for multiple myeloma patients. 
And Lucille would like to know whether CAR-T works for patients with myelofibrosis. Right now, we don't have any trials looking at uh, uh, CAR-T cells for myelofibrosis. And myelofibrosis is a disease for which we, have, we really don't have uh, a lot of cell therapy protocols or trials that are being looked at. Uh, myelofibrosis is treated with stem cell transplant now more than it was before. So I think that eventually we may get there, but right now is not something that's being, that's being done. And Sydney wants to know whether CAR-T can prevent B-cell lymphoma in Wiscott Aldrich patients. We haven't looked at this as a therapy for prevention. Uh, we've looked at, uh, we looked at it as a therapy, as a therapy for treatment. Um, can it prevent it? Uh, I think it'll be difficult because of the way that the, uh, that the therapy works. Um, we need some sort of, uh, you know, more of a vaccine uh, platform or a vaccine therapy in that case to prevent lymphoma from happening. This therapy is mostly about treating lymphoma that's already there. Okay, Martin is 67 years old and he's concerned about the length of the remission. He says his oncologist says to expect it's only one year on average. Uh, he has cardiovascular disease but has no heart disease or stroke. Uh, can he be a candidate for CAR T? It, it, it would have to, you know, we would have to do an evaluation with with, his, with the center that can provide that treatment. Just from from, from uh, the age and the uh, and the comorbidities that I'm hearing, I don't see a reason why not. But we'll have to do a full evaluation as to, you know, whether the patient is able to to get this treatment. But it it sounds like it's it's a possibility. Uh, Lynn wants to know whether CAR T will help someone like her with pro lymphocytic leukemia. So prolymphocytic leukemia is uh, one, one of the rare uh, blood cancers. Um, right now, I'm not aware of any trials that are looking at, uh, at targeting PLL. Now, PLL does have some of the same markers that lymphomas have, that leukemias have. So eventually, I think we'll get there. Um, but uh, it's, uh, there's no specific trial for PLL, uh, but it's, it's a therapy that in theory should work for PLL once we prove it safe. Um, Mindy wants to know whether, what other types of immunotherapy are available for patients and how do you choose among them? So depending on the type of uh, cancer that you have, there are multiple types of immunotherapies. Um, we've talked about CAR T-cell therapy, which is cellular therapy. There are different kinds of cellular therapies that are available. Um, there are antibodies that are available to treat cancer, something that we've been using for many years in lymphoma, for many years in breast cancer. Uh, there are checkpoint inhibitors, which are those guys that we talked about that can take the breaks of the immune system. That therapy, um, in so checkpoint inhibitors in combination with CAR T-cell therapy have really revolutionized the treatment of cancer. Uh, checkpoint inhibitors are used in many solid cancers, melanoma, renal cell, lung cancer, uh, with very good results. Uh, BITES are another type of immunotherapy that we use. Uh, BITE stands for bite-specific a T cell engager is a way to redirect your body's T cells to target a tumor. Uh, the one bite that's FDA approved is a, a bite to treat ALL. Um, we've been using immunotherapy for several years in, in melanoma and renal cells. Sometimes we use cytokines, just like we talked about cytokine release syndrome as being one of the side effects of, uh, of CAR T cell therapy. In the past, for many years, we have used cytokines themselves to treat cancer because they are an inflammatory molecule. And um, of course, you know, bone marrow transplant, an allogeneic bone marrow transplant is the most widely used immunotherapy. We depend on the graft versus leukemia effect, the graft versus lymphoma effect to cure cancer. So um, although it doesn't seem like it, we have been using immunotherapy for some time, but it wasn't until the last decade that it really just became a major tool that we could use. James wants to know whether multiple expressions of multiple myeloma, such as CD19, CD38, et cetera, can be treated with a single CAR-T treatment or are only specific expressions treated at a given time? So that's a very good question uh, because one of the, the reasons that we think that uh, CAR-T cells fail is because they target a single protein. Uh, there are studies and there are, there are researchers that are looking at generating CAR T cells that can target more than one protein at the same time. 
Uh, right now, that's not available yet, but I think it will be in the future. Uh, and that may be the next generation CAR T cell therapy. I believe that uh, um, we'll move forward with it and targeting multiple antigens at the same time, multiple proteins, uh, will be part of the future of CAR T cell therapy. Um, and then there are multiple questions about whether you can do a second CAR-T therapy after one fails. I believe you addressed that, but just maybe do a summary of that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it, it's, it's going to be de dependent on the patient. Uh, we plan on doing only one CAR-T cell therapy in some patients, uh, we do multiples depending on whether there is enough product available, on whether we've had a response initially, and also on what we're trying to do with that patient. That that has to be considered on a patient by patient basis. It is possible to give more than one treatment of CAR T cells. It is not something that's commonly done, uh, as we typically just plan on one treatment with CAR T cells. Allison has asked a question, and I can help with this. Uh, she wanted to know the average cost of CAR T and whether there are any resources to offset the cost to patients uh, besides insurance. Yeah, so um, I think uh, it, the, the prices of, of CAR T cells are out there uh, for the treatment of ALL. Uh, the cost of the therapy itself, just the drug, uh, is somewhere around $475,000. Um, for the treatment of lymphoma, it's somewhere in the $370,000, $380,000 range. Um, there are other costs that are associated with it, the hospital costs, the medication costs. Um, there's been a lot of discussion between providers, insurances, uh, Medicare, uh, to try to bring some of those costs down to come up with an agreement of how can we get this treatment to patients. Um, each center is gonna have a different set of uh, resources that can be used to help the patient uh, financially. Uh, and I know that, Sue, you probably have some, some things that uh, uh, some other avenues to uh, to find some support. Yes, you can contact BMT InfoNet, although we don't pay for the cost of treatment. There are funds available to help with some of the things like travel, lodging, uh, food while you're undergoing treatment, and there are some more other organizations that provide some help as well. So you can contact BMT InfoNet, and we can try to put you in touch with organizations that can be of help. I think for the last question, we have so many people asking this question. Um, I believe you answered it, but we'll just take one last shot at it as the summary question for ending the, uh, this session. Is CAR-T therapy something anyone should consider while they are in remission? At this time, no. And at this time, uh, I say that because the way that the cells are made, they're made so that recognize tumor cells that are there. Um, now, the question is, do we think that there are tumor cells that are hiding somewhere if somebody's in remission? It's possible. Uh, I think at some point this may be looked as a, as a treatment for consolidation for somebody that had a good response to, to therapy. Um, right now, it's not being looked at that way. It's possible. Um, but right now, it's not something that's considered for patients that are in remission. And with that, I think we will wrap it up. Dr. Varela, I want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, if you have questions, do not hesitate to contact BMT InfoNet at 888-597-7674 or again at help at bmtinfonet.org uh, and we will reach out to help you. Thank you very much for a great presentation and evening, folks. Be well and good night.